Are you ready to take your screenwriting career to the next level? If you're a new or aspiring screenwriter who feels lost or stuck in your career, the Working Writer School is here to teach you what writing courses don't. Former student Dylan Evans said, There are a ton of writing classes out there, but this course helped me work through the stuff that I couldn't find anywhere else. I feel more prepared and more knowledgeable to take on the next phase of my writing career. Writer Nicole Bennett said, After taking this course, I have a clear framework for the mindset, productivity, networking, and financial management skills needed for longevity in this industry. And Jay Burlingham calls this course the map. This course has given me a map that I will return to again and again as I move forward in my career as a writer. Use code MMIH for 10% off from now until January 31st and go to theworkingwriter.com. That's theworking, W-E-R-K-I-N-G, writer.com to sign up today. You know, making movies is hard. Making movies is hard. Welcome. This is a podcast about the struggle of being an independent filmmaker. I'm Mark Purcell, the founding host of the podcast, and I'm a sci-fi horror filmmaker, and my first feature film, The Alternate, will be coming out later this year. I'm Liz Manischel. I'm a writer, director, producer who has made two features, Speed of Life and Bread and Butter, and I'm currently in pre-production on my third, Best Friends Forever. I'm a distribution consultant who used to manage Sundance's Creative Distribution Initiative, and I do sales. This week on our phenomenal 400th episode of the show, woohoo! we welcome producer Natalie Quisay on the show to talk about rising the ranks as a producer and she gives a bit of a breakdown of the making of searching 2 which isn't even out yet it's coming out next year i think and we also play another round of the game which is very exciting hopefully it's a sp- extra special 400th episode edition and then we talk about what we learned across 400 episodes of the show or in liz's case about 200 episodes of making this show but first liz how are you doing today and i never i always like prep for the podcast and i always forget that you're gonna ask me this question every, every week Every like, week. What is that about? How am I doing? I'm trying desperately not to peek on my microphone. I'm monitoring the levels. <laughs> I, I noticed that last week it got real rough around the edges on my audio. So I'm trying to be better for everyone. Well, how am I? I'm uh, good. <laughs> <laughs> I'm okay. What what is going on in my life? I'm like un- I'm at that part of a production where you're like, we know we're making the movie. We know that far off in the future are major problems like finding the budget and casting the film and finding locations, but we're not there yet. And we're in this like really weird gray zone of like, what do we do next? What do we do to best set ourselves up for success? Usually it's like, oh, I'll work on the deck or I'll work on the script. But I feel like there's something else I'm supposed to be doing. And that's where I am right now is in that gray zone of like, what should I be doing right now? I think I should be doing a lot more than I'm doing right now. So that's how I feel. How are you? Let's let's checklist it really quick. Yeah. Budget and schedules that already been worked on by somebody. We, yeah, we already have it done, but it's not accurate because we need to like, because the whole thing is like, it's budgeted as if it's a traditional 18 to 23 day movie. So it's like, we need to update that to a non-traditional production schedule, but we can't do that until me and my producers all come together and decide what that is. Like, are we shooting Mm. three days on, four days off? Are we shooting weekends across six months? Are we shooting, you know, are we splitting the shoot into two? So, yes, we have a temp document, but it's... It's not the final document. So do you have you have you like pro and pros, then like a pro and con sort of thing for each of the different options and like kind of talked out like what the benefits of yeah, shooting just some weekends or shooting three days on, four days off, or doing in two batches? Like have you kind of done all that? Because that's a lot of homework. Yeah. You could probably be working on it. Probably be doing that. That sounds right. My Uh, Last week, I talked about like film utopia. And so I did this document of like saying what I think what a film utopia would be. It's But it's still too, it's not pragmatic enough. It's not like these are the days I want to shoot. And this is exactly the process I want to shoot. So I think that's, I like your assignment. I need assignments. I like your assignment of pro con lists because that feels within my reach to do and something that could be beneficial. Yeah. Cause you want to get to that place where you can actually start planning the movie, right? Where you're like, we'll shoot these days and we need this, these things. And these are the things we need, the people we need, the days we need, the time we're going to do it in the places we're going to shoot at, you know? And so the closer you get to like being able to do those things, the better. And I feel like once you decide on your, your method, then like, you know, starting to look for locations and like actually booking a location could be possible like once you figure out your style, right? Right. Which I think is like super exciting. Cause it's like when I, when I talk to people who are making movies in their houses or in locations they own, 
like that is super exciting because it's basically like you can you have control like it's like when we made red snow it was like oh well we're booking this you know cabin that we have access to through his family for these days and yeah. we're we have it it's in we have to shoot and then so let's work towards shooting then like what do we need in the movie we need a christmas tree okay we'll buy a christmas tree or we'll get a fake one or what do we need we need this we get so they just started gathering all the props all the set dressing like finding the other locations that we needed in town you know and like once all those things happen that are like oh they're tangible it's like then you can actually the movie starts to come together in your brain, like as a director and as a producer, like it starts yeah. to form, you know? Yeah. I feel like you're so close to that p- point. It's exciting. Well, <laughs> what I th- thank you. I think the hard nut to crack here is I want to be as accommodating as possible. And I'm a people pleaser, even though I'm a curmudgeon, I'm a curmudgeon people pleaser. And I think the issue is I keep thinking, what's going to be easiest for everyone? You know, oh, my cinematographer wants to retain all her crew. Let's do a 40 day shoot instead of an 18 day shoot. Let's do a 40 day shoot instead of five, five days. You know, I started I started accommodating to her instead of going back and thinking like, no, what do you want, Liz? What is what is the paradigm you're actually trying to make happen rather than asking everyone their opinion? Do you ever this is a, maybe a very a girl thing, but you ever notice like when, <laughs> there's always like one friend in a group of friends who goes on Facebook or Twitter and is like, should I get a haircut? And then they just like do whatever Facebook or Twitter tells them to do. <laughs> like, oh, I should get pics. I should get pics. What do you think? What do I do? It's like that. I feel like I'm like the girl who wants the haircut and I'm not just deciding for myself whether I should get the haircut or not. So I'm working yeah, on that. That's an interesting idea. I should, because I'm so indecisive sometimes. Like, I feel like maybe I should go to Twitter. No, <laughs> just decide for yourself. That's not the takeaway. <laughs> the takeaway. <laughs> I should be like the girl asking about the haircut. No, I'm just kidding. I mean, but I mean more like with like, should I have a burrito or pizza? You know, like <laughs> do a poll on Twitter and just, but do I just don't have enough friends who follow me for that to work. So um, yeah, it would be like Lucas Cole shop. Be like, get it. Burrito. Shut up. Do what, <laughs> eat what you want to eat, you dumbass. Yeah, Lucas would just be like, <laughs> you give the perfect answer, actually, each time. We should just all ask Lucas Colshaw what to do. Yeah, I think that would be good. <laughs> what are you up yeah, to? Yeah, so that's exciting. What am I up to? Yeah, just uh, still, you know, working with my team on this movie, which is exciting. You know, got another offer out this week. Yeah. Oh, I got to give a big shout out to Ian Nelms of the Nelms Brothers. <gasps> yes. You know, previous guests of the show, friends of the show. He texted me on Thanksgiving because we talked like a few weeks ago. uh, I was asking him about like, how do you navigate this madness? Because he's done it like three or four times, you know, with his movies. And he was like, yeah, he gave me some really great advice. And then, you know, he was just, I guess, being a sweetheart and thinking about this. And he just tossed me a bunch of names and he tossed me like another idea of like, well, rather than like just going after the big names first, like, why don't you get supporting cast? Mm. who like are actor friendly, like actors that, you know, you've seen in many yeah. things, but uh, like, aren't going to bring the budget in, but like cast them in the supporting roles. And so when you're going out to your bigger cash, you can be like, yeah, I've got like, I'm just going to throw out a name here. Clifton Collins Jr. Is in my movie. Like you love him. He's fucking amazing. You don't even know who he is, but his face, you would know. Have you seen Westworld? Yes. So season one of Westworld, he was like the robot who like Ed Harris is like, you know, making like be a Sherpa, like through the park, you know, and I think they even cut out a scalp to like, Oh find yeah. Map I do whatever. recognize his face. Yeah. yeah. He's amazing. He also shout out to a wonderful movie. Oh my God. What is the name of it? It's the one with James Vanderbeek where he like is like plays a drunk college student. Wait. And it's like all the intersecting stories. Oh man. Well, I don't know. I mean, if it's not varsity blues, then I don't know. No, it's like after varsity blues, like, like, showing a completely different side of James Jason Van, Van Der Beek. But yeah, he plays a, a drug dealer in that movie. Oh. Yeah, it was The Rules of Attraction, 2002. Oh. Mm-hmm. Have you seen that? No. Oh my God. Ugh. That's the one you guys should dig up. That's a freak of a movie. <laughs> really cool. I saw it in the theater and I walked out like, what am I doing with my life? Like, I'm in high school. What should I be doing? I should be doing something. This is like, this is madness. Anyways. It's fun. Written written and directed by a uh, co-producer or J- Roger Avery, who worked on Quentin Tarantino's Pulp oh, Fiction. Oh. So yeah. And also j- edited completely on Final Cut Pro. 
I think the first movie that was like released in theaters to be edited on Final Cut Pro. Wait, I Anyways. love that we're like in a nutshell within a nutshell within a nutshell right now. <laughs> like, where's what was, okay, we got here through Ian, Ian Nelms, uh, right? Yeah, yeah. So, anyways, yeah, we're talking about Clifton Collins Jr., who's in that movie. <laughs> So, yeah, so he basically gave me all this wonderful advice of like what I should like things I could be doing at this yeah. stage to help my movie get made and like actors to consider and ways to approach and some insider tips. So I just wanted to thank Ian Nelms for that. Oh, pass it on to my team. They were they were very receptive. I feel like we're, we're kind of in a good place right now with like our momentum. It just kind of depends on like, you know, what these actors say, you know, but we have a good plan. If we get a bunch of no's, we're going to go to the next group, next group, you know, whatever. But yeah, I've been wanting to write a lot. I was talking to my um, my brother-in-law at Thanksgiving and he was like, what are you working on, bro? I'm like, well, <laughs> <laughs> that's how he talks. <laughs> a bunch of different things. Like I, I, I pitched him this movie that I'd started writing like, like last year. Like I wrote like half of it on the plane back from the you know nightmare film festival in italy that i went to i remember you talking about this you were so excited about this idea and then i like dropped it because it was like i I cannot make this movie for under a million dollars like it's just not gonna happen so i like started working on something else i had some other great ideas Hmm. but like basically realized that like dude like you need to just write this movie like just finish it write it you already have it all outlined you have half of it written just like that should be my winter, you know, like winter to spring assignment is to like write this movie by by my birthday, write it by March 11th, you know, and then like that would be like, it's not too hard. It's it's enough time where I have time to do it. And then I'd have a sample at least, you know, something to show people but like, look, I wrote this. This is great. And then, you know, one day once I have more money and like, you know, made a few more movies, maybe I can make that movie, you know? Yeah. So that's like my new thing that I want to do. It's like, maybe call it my new year's resolution. So that's where I'm at. I'm also working my ass off on, uh, you know, Jeff's movie, or I guess you call it Mitch's movie. Mitch Mitch Altieri. Yeah. Yeah, We love Mitch, which is great. So that's going to be, that's due by the end of the year. So like, that's going to be like a crazy December thing to, to, to help him finish that up. And then I might, Jeff's got another movie that he's shooting right now. No. Start production yesterday. No. Or no. I'm shaking my head at you. No, <laughs> I shouldn't assistant edit this movie. No, Come on. Uh, all right. All right. Stay what in is the, the mix. thread of every single conversation we have when you are talking about something that you want to do or can't do is time. You need yeah. more time. But I need the need the Skrilla. You know, you have some a full, what, your salary well, job is not enough. Eh, well, what's what's ever enough, right? You know. <laughs> yeah, you know, exactly. Want to want to buy some stuff? You know, fix up the house, uh, save some more money. You know, pay off some bills. Like, yeah, you're always good to have a little extra cash. Your time is worth more. Your t- unless you're unless you cannot put, you know, put food on the table as a family. Your time is hmm. worth more money. Hmm. Hmm. All right. Hmm. You're going to feel better. You're going to get some hmm. sleep and you're hmm. going to be creatively fulfilled. Hmm. I know you disagree. I like interesting, interesting <laughs> bit, bits. Um, there, I just I'll, peeked I'll, at the microphone I'll, with my spit take. <laughs> <laughs> um, sorry, folks. Oh, man. Also, spit takes. I was at this holiday party. Well, I should not only like a holiday party. It's more like a team building event with my company. And uh, the director I'm working with on this project right now made me spit take twice at the party. And uh, I don't even remember w- what they were. It was like one was a look across the table that just like I was like, dude, got me. And then the other one, I don't even remember what it was, but it was like that was I was like, I did it. I was like, dude, that's number two today. So shout out to John Paul Galetti for making me laugh twice like that. It's party. I don't know. I think that's it. Got to move on with life. I don't know. I'm very excited that this is a Forge with episode. A uh, big shout out to everyone who's listened all the way through our 400th episodes. I mean, my God, you people are dedicated. So, <laughs> so thank you for listening. And here's to what? 400 more, Liz? Can you do 400 yeah. more with me? Sure. Yeah. Why not? All right. Yeah. All right. Yeah. I think so. Sweet. <laughs> I love it. But don't forget to support us on Patreon, www.patreon.com slash MMIH podcast. That is where you can go to make sure this this show does survive another 400 episodes. We have more and more of our episodes being put behind the paywall. Right now, seasons seven and eight are fully available. This is basically the start of season nine. Seasons five and six are not available. Oh, wait. Yeah, five and six, not available. And season four is about to not be available. So if you want those back episodes, listen while you can. I might go back in there and like make a couple like back available just for fun, like the alternate episodes. I talk about those a lot, like the making of the alternate. Like those are all yeah. behind the paywall now. But I might I might pull those back, just those eight or so episodes, just so people can listen to those. 
those if they want. But yeah, we'll see. But anyways, go to Patreon. That's where you get to like get those access to those episodes. You also get access to um, our weekly meetings where you get to see Eric, third uh, part of the, th- the show. Well, actually, so he's third. Jeff is fourth. So we got four team members, right? Like that's that's our team. Am I missing anyone? Three, no. three, three dudes and me is what it is. Three dudes <laughs> and Liz. <laughs> that's how I dudes, see it. Three dudes and Liz. <laughs> that's what it is. No, Jeff, uh, Jeff and Eric are, are parallel. They are, they are, yeah. we're all the same. It's all one horizontal hierarchy situation. Yeah. yeah. But, uh, but yeah, Eric gets to be on, you get to see Eric in, in, in the video form and hear his yes. words being said. And he's he very funny. He's he makes me words. laugh a lot, which I think is really great. Jeff, you'll never get to hear from until maybe sometime. I don't know. But yeah, Jeff, you just get to. We've never met Jeff. Like, that's the crazy part of this whole thing. Talked to him on a Zoom and he was quite charming. You you got to see his face. Got to see his face when we interviewed him, you know, and and he charmed us into giving. So he's real. He's He's not like a catfish. Okay, that's good. We know he's real, too, because he went from, I believe, Portland to New York. Anyone can so, invent a, a fabricated move. True. Oh, I'm near the Empire State Building now. Oh, here's a picture. Like, no, you could. You could. <laughs> the other thing to do after you check out us on Patreon is don't forget to check out Jambox.io. They're a new royalty-free music and sound effects company with an emphasis on high-quality cinematic cues. Their composers have worked on soundtracks for Hollywood-level films and working with directors like Michael Bay and Martin Scorsese. So go check them out today. Use our code MMIH podcast, uh, 20% off. It's great. But without any more delay, here's our chat with Natalie Wasabian. Could you give us the elevator pitch for Searching 2? Yeah, of course. So Searching 2 is about a young girl. She's a teenager named June. And it's her and her mom. The two of them live together. Dad's out of the picture. He died when June was young. June is a bit of a rebellious teenager. So one week, mom decides she's going to go on this trip with her new boyfriend. And June decides she's going to party it up like most 17-year-olds do. And, you know, she has to go and pick up her mom from the airport after the week passes She barely makes it in time because she's cleaning up the house and trying to get rid of all the evidence of of a week of debauchery. (laughs) And as she's waiting at the airport, her mom doesn't come off the plane. Mom and boyfriend don't come off the plane. And they're basically missing in a different country. They were in Cartagena, Colombia. And now June, our 17-year-old protagonist, has to figure out where her mom is and you know who might be behind her disappearance if you're familiar with the first searching film we had a father looking for a missing teenage daughter so it's kind of the opposite and this time june realizes she can't really get into her mom's computer or her accounts but she finds a way to get into the boyfriend's accounts and as she dives in she kind of sees that things aren't what they always seem on the surface mm. Awesome. So how many days did you shoot the film? We shot for 15 days in LA and then we went to Cartagena, which was awesome for four days. It was wow. only 19. Oh my God. What can you say about the budget? What can I say about the budget? It's bigger than the first film, which was $880,000 because it was non-union, but it's probably one of like the smallest studio movies you can make. So it's wow. under 10, you know, but, but more than a million. Nice. And then how did you or the team come up with the idea for the movie? So when we made Searching One, uh, it's so weird to call it Searching One because it was it was an independent <laughs> movie. It was never meant to spawn a sequel. Spoiler alert, if you haven't seen it, it's about a girl that goes missing and then is found. So we used to joke about sequels and say, well, she can't go missing again. The dad can't go missing because that's lame. <laughs> So, yeah, it was one of those things where it was just so wildly successful. The first movie beyond, I think, what any of us could have imagined for it. It grows $75 million at the box office on an under $1 million budget. Wow. And the studio approached us and said, hey, guys, what about a sequel? And our initial thought was, like, do you guys, like, what kind of sequel? She can't go missing again. Dad can't go missing. That's lame. And also, frankly, we were a little bit like, and Anish, our director, was like, I don't know if I can do another screen thing. Like, I don't know if I can bring something fresh to it. We we put all of our, he put so much of himself into that. But then it was Sev who had this idea and kind of approached me and Anish and said, what if it's not like the same characters? What if we treat it like an anthology series? 
So it's a, what if we do another thriller, another missing persons thing and tell it in this like cool format where it's all on screens and let's go to Sony and, and, you know, just pitch them something like that. And, and, and then we kind of came around, but me and Anish were like, I don't think we can do it. Like another, like three years of screens and stuff. And then Sev pitched us basically like the elevator pitch that I gave you guys. And we were like, okay, that's awesome. Like young protagonist this time, like another parent child thing that we can like emotionally hook into. So it's really kudos to Sev for getting me and Anish to get hyped about it. <laughs> Working on the film from that elevator pitch from Sev until its eventual release. Probably close to three years now, but I would say like time expanded because COVID hit mm-hmm. right when we were basically right when we were finishing up the screenplay or the treatment. I can't, what is time anymore? I don't know, but nobody knows. So what would have been like two years kind of became three years because of the pandemic things kind of like slowed down but it is a long journey on these movies because they're like animated essentially so it take post-production itself has been over a year and a half now Mm. a minute (laughs) (laughs) and then compared to all the projects you've made how difficult was this one oh man difficult (laughs) i feel like every project is difficult And every project is difficult in different ways. And this one was difficult in ways that I hadn't anticipated, even though we'd already made a movie like this and it follows the same format. We were trying to do more this time. Like it's, it's bigger. There's more production value. There's more twists and turns. So with that came just like creative challenges. And then we were working with a studio. So our team, which we worked with on the first film, but we were independent. We had a financier who wasn't very hands-on. We had a lot of freedom. And this time we were making it from, you know, from pitch to till the end, there's been a studio involved. So that always brings, you know, pros and cons, obviously, but it does make it, there's more cooks in the kitchen. Can you go into it a little bit with Sony? Like they approached you, they said, what about a sequel? And then once you pitched the idea that Sev kind of came up with, was it just a green light? Like, is that how it works? Is it just like, here is the money that we want? This is exactly what we wanted? Or what what are the details of that? I, I wish. I feel like studios never... I've only made two movies with a studio, but like, I feel like they don't officially say you're green, like go. <laughs> like I've got to talk to pe- more people about this, but I really don't think they ever say it or like put it in writing. There just comes a point where they're like, all right, we're cash flowing you. And you're like, okay, I guess I'm going to start spending money. So this was similar. Basically we, we went in, we, we pitched it, I think over the phone, the initial idea and then Seven and Niche were down to do like a treatment. They, we knew they didn't want to write the screenplay. And we felt like whoever wrote the screenplay should direct because it's such a like intimate process. And, and we knew if Anish wasn't directing it, the only two people in the world that could direct it were Will, Will Merrick and Nick Johnson, who edited the first film. And th- we actually gave them a, another credit in addition to editors. They, they were called Directors of Virtual Photography. And that's because they did so much more than edit the movie. They, they really, with Anish, like came up with the visual language and style of the movie. And so on the first one, we wanted to honor that by giving them some kind of title. So we approached them. Though they were writing a script for Paramount at the time and said, would you guys want to do this? They said yes. So then we went to Sony and said like, all right, here's the plan. And a lot of this comes from Sev being like, we got to be proactive. Like, let's go in, like knowing the vision. So we went and we were like, Seven Niche will write a treatment. So you guys know you're getting like, you know, the, the searching twists and turns. Will and Nick are going to write it. They wrote another script. They're excellent screenwriters. Here you go. And they're going to direct it because they're the only people in the world that could direct this other than a niche. And that was enticing to them because they felt, I think they felt like they were in good hands and like we were coming to them with like, the train is moving, you know, are you guys getting on, even though they were the ones that came to us. And, you know, then from there, it was like the usual, like we turned in a treatment, they they did notes, thumbs up, greenlit us to script stage, notes and notes and notes, pre, pre soft prep, like kind of starts somewhere in there, even without like finances, you kind of start casting and stuff. And then somewhere in there, we were like, we need cash. And, and like I said, you open the bank account, and like, the cash appears, but I really don't think I have an email or had a phone call that was like, you're greenlit. 
you just go. Liz, you know, it's like, you just go. (laughs) (laughs) That is true. You do just go. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. That's so funny. So the, I want to ask a really nerdy producer question right now. In this process, what, at what point do you come to them with a budget or do they come to you with a budget? And, and how does that process work? Like, do they give you a number that you have to hit and then you try to hit that number? Do they give you a rough budget and then you like kind of work it, work it yourself? Like, how does that whole process work from a producer yeah, standpoint? Totally. Also not a nerdy question. I love this. So like they knew what the budget of the first movie was, which was like a bad thing for us because they're like, oh, we can make this. We can probably do this for like two million. And like, as any producer knows, like the minute you go union, like even if you have a contained concept, like. I've yet to see like a two or $3 million movie. It's just like, it's like you're either like five or like 10, you know what I mean? So we were proactive. We had a feeling that they were going to try to get us to be lower just because they knew how low we could make it for with the first film. So we were proactive and put a budget together and put that in front of them based on the treatment. There wasn't even a script yet. So I think, I think I roughed the budget out with Sev and did like a rough schedule and put that in front of them just to like kind of incept in their minds that it wasn't going to be a $2 million movie, but it's, it's with all the caveats of like, there's no script yet. So this is very rough. And then, you know, they were like, copy that. Let's see the script. And you just kind of soften them up to the idea of like the rough number you're trying to get to. And then of course they, they made us cut like one, one, like a 1.2 out of what we wanted originally. But, you know, we made it work. Well, let's go back. <laughs> let's go back in time. <laughs> let's travel back in time. Can you talk a little bit about what inspired you to become a producer in the first place? And also, like, what other participations you've done in the film industry other than producing? Because I'm sure they're just, like, disparate and numerous. And let's hear more yeah. about you. Yeah, for sure. So I'm Armenian American. I grew up in L.A., but I grew up in the Valley and like went to Armenian school all my life. So it felt very, Hollywood felt like very far away, even though it was like a 15 minute drive on the 101. And my, my dad's a doctor. My mom's a therapist grew up very like the immigrant mentality of like, you know, the, the jobs that you can see when you're young or doctor, lawyer, engineer, all that stuff. But I was like one of those nerdy kids that 10 years old got a video camera for Christmas and was just like making shorts, didn't have a lot of friends. So I used to like animate inanimate objects and make like stop motion stuff. Very, very nerdy. And so I kind of knew from a young age, I wanted to be in film, but I didn't really know like the entry point. But then I went to a Catholic high school in Burbank called Providence that my older sister had gone to. And they had a media focus program, which was really cool. So every year, instead of an elective, you would take something media based. So like one year you were doing production stuff, one year you were doing advertising, And that was like a big eye opener for me because it was one I learned as silly as it sounds now, but at 14 and not knowing anyone in the industry, I was like, oh, I can actually like make a career out of this. And it was in that class that it was kind of like film. It was like a mini film school. You would all like rotate crew positions and write direct and, and, and everything else. And no matter what I did on a project, whether I was like the writer or the director, I always also became the producer and not even by choice half the time. It was usually because like the assigned producer would just, you know, that one person in the group project that doesn't like, doesn't show up. So I would always become like the de facto producer. And by the time senior year came around, I was kind of like, all right, I think, I think I should just like embrace the fact that like, I think this chose me and I have a skill set for it. And, and I was really lucky that in that program, like they taught us creative producing. It wasn't just like make the budget and, and do the logistics. And then when I got to USC to film school, which my dad had told me, my parents had told me like, we'll support you in pursuing this as long as you can like get a job after you graduate undergrad. So that was my like challenge. So I went to USC because I was like, the only way to meet people is probably going to be going to the best film school got in and, you know, interned my way through. And then the day I graduated, I got a call from my supervisor, my internship. I was working at City Room Creative at the time. They're like a production company slash trailer house at the time. They did Zero Dreams of Sushi, which was like their big thing at the time. And I was working under the line producer there. So getting like really cool, like real world um, tactile knowledge. And he called me and he was like, I need you Monday. So I guess I have to pay you. You're hired. (laughs) <laughs> and I was like, look at, I did it. Yeah. And, and just kind of, yeah, always, always knew I wanted to produce through USC. And 
I think when I got there and I looked around and everyone, everyone kind of wanted to write and direct, it, it felt like, all right, well, at least hopefully there'll be a job for me. Like it felt more hopeful becoming a producer for some reason. And uh, yeah. So can you talk a little bit about like going from that first job or maybe there's maybe many jobs between that and your first feature, but I mean, I feel like the the idea of like working at like a day job at a production company and then moving to producing independent film, that's like a pretty huge leap. So could you talk about how you made that leap? Yeah, definitely a scary one. So I was working at City Room Creative at the time and then I wanted to switch to a company because they were doing mostly documentaries at the time. I wanted to switch to a company that was doing, you know, narrative fiction features. So I moved to a company called Electric City Entertainment, lots of cities, which was at the time owned by Lynette Howell and Jamie Patrickoff. And they'd done The Place Beyond the Pines, Blue Valentine, like really awesome indies that I loved. So I got a job there as a PA actually on their documentaries. But I was like, you know what? They do docs, but they also do features. So maybe if I just like get in, I can switch gears. So I got in, was an office PA and like very quickly became a production coordinator, like within two months and just, you know, got to know everyone there and put it in their ears. Like, Hey, I want to be creative producer. I would love to like be up for an assistant job to one of the producers. If that ever, there was ever an opening that happened. I went through this like grueling process to become Jamie Patrickoff's assistant, got it and was like over the moon. Cause I was like, wow, I can see, I can see the path now, you know, like work for Jamie, maybe in like five years, I'll get like an AP credit on something. Then I'll work my my way up to Kopi because that's kind of what his former assistant had done. And I was like, this is it. Like, this is how I'm going to get on, get on features. And like a month into the job, I was just like, I was just like swimming and like, couldn't get to the surface. I was drowning and couldn't get to the surface. Like it was so intense It was so unlike being on the actual like production side of things, which I was much more used to. And a part of me felt like I was like effing up all the time. I didn't know, like I'd never been an assistant. So I didn't know the, like the lingo. I'd never gone to the mail room. And like, I just felt so intimidated and I honestly was doing not a great job. And that felt like awful. So I made a really hard decision after like three months to quit. And I remember a lot of people around me, like friends and mentors were like, don't quit. Like this is, you can, you can go and you can pivot this assistant job into like any other assistant job. And I was just like, I can't do it. Like I need to, I think I need to be back on set. Like, I think, I think I'm so used to making things. And so I quit probably right before Jamie was going to fire me, honestly, like I I was not doing a great job. And I was like, I'm just going to go and produce produce things. Like I'm going to go on unemployment and I'm going to like go and do shorts and music videos. I had friends that were, you know, people that were just graduated or, you know, people a couple of years ahead of me that I met at USC. And like, again, back to that theme of like, everyone needs a producer. And I was like free at this time. So I was like, please hire me. And so I started doing shorts, music videos, just like anything I could get my hands on. And it was at this time that Sev Ohanian, who I'm now married to, who I had met when I was at USC, he called me from like day two of a production in Savannah, Georgia on this movie called The Intervention. And he was like, I need like a coordinator, UPM type person, stat. I have like two people working on this whole movie on the production side. And I'm I'm like dying. Could you, could you fly out like tomorrow? And I was like, you know what? Like, yeah, it's a feature. Like who, who would say no to that? Right. So I flew out and we were making this tiny, tiny movie on this like island outside of Savannah, totally remote, like a logistical nightmare. But I went in and the EP on that movie was this badass woman named Mel Eslin, who runs the Duplass Brothers production company. I think they had just signed like their first five picture deal with Netflix. They were like on the cusp of like just blowing up and and really like making a lot of movies each year. And Mel was like a couple of days in Mel was just like, who are you? Please tell me you want to be a producer. I have to do all these movies. Can I like take you under my wing and just like have you work under me? And I was like, oh my God, so happy that I said yes to Sev and just like felt so validated in that moment for for quitting the assistant job. Cause I was like, you can work as a producer. And so cut to like what became a three or four year, I think like journey with Mel, just learning from her, working under her, 
and kind of working my way up from Kopi to like my, she gave me my first producer credit. And I just, I joked that that was my, I never, I didn't go to grad school for film. I went back later and got an MBA, but like the Duplass Brothers productions was my grad school. Cause I, I did so much, they're all small movies under a million so I got to do a little bit of everything and it was it was the best education ever. Can you talk a little bit about the character traits that make up a good producer? I mean, just at the base level when you're in high school and you're doing this video production class or whatever, you know, whatever it is the specialty media class is, what characteristics were you defaulting to to become the producer that you are today? Yeah. The obvious, the boring one is like just being super organized. I think like everyone's looking for that in a producer. And that was definitely one of the big things in high school. Cause again, it was like, so-and-so didn't show up, not stepping in. She already has it under control. But I think the biggest thing is probably having the ability to, you know, as a producer, you're wearing so many hats. Like you're, you're wearing a creative hat. You're wearing a budget hat, a schedule hat. You have to be a diplomat. Sometimes you have to keep the peace between everyone. You know, you go from talking to a studio head in a day to talking to like a crazy neighbor who's trying to like, you know, ruin the shoot, who's unhappy with you shooting next door. And I think the biggest thing is like the ability to like zoom out as a producer and constantly be able to see like the forest from the trees it's like when I think about what a director does, I feel like they're the opposite. Like they're so zoomed in on like every little detail or one specific details, one one specific piece of a take. And then they have to like zoom out later in the process. But as a producer, you're constantly like, you have to be able to like look from over here and make sure all the pieces are running. So I think it's like that ability to constantly like see the whole picture is probably, it sounds a little abstract, but but definitely that definitely organized, definitely people skills. I think you have to like, you have to like dealing with people. That's literally what you're doing 90% of the time. And then creative problem solving. Like that to me is like the, the most fun I get out of it is like, here's a sequence. We don't have enough money. We're not going to be able to do all this VFX, sit down with the director, sit down with the writer, sit down with the other producers and just like figure it out. Like that's the fun that's the stuff that like takes me back to my inner child of like, okay, don't have any friends, got mom's lipsticks, we're going to do some stop motion. But yeah, that's, that's the that's the part that I think is the most fun. And I think it's the most important, like having that creative and like critical thinking, problem solving juice in your brain. What were some of the things that you learned in your, you know, grad school, quote unquote, working on those first few movies? Like, are there any like big pr- tips as a producer or things that you learned that helped you in taking on projects in the future? Yeah, I think one of the biggest things I took away from Mel and just like the Duplass family is they really, really care about taking care of the crew and like fostering the sense of family. And it's like all the little things, right? It's like making sure there's great great food, like great catering, even if you have a, you know, $10,000 budget, making sure like people are having lunch together and like mingling, making sure people feel heard. Like all that stuff is something that no one can really like teach you. I feel like you have to, you have to see someone demonstrating that. So to see Mel do that and bring that like energy to the set every day was very, very cool. And something I take with me. And then in terms of like practical things, literally everything you guys, like there was one movie where I, we didn't have enough money for a location manager or, or someone quit. I can't remember. So I did, I did locations. I've music supervised. I've literally done like every position that you could kind of rationalize as like, sure. The producer can handle that. I've done it. And it came from them and it came from Mel, like truly like just picking up the phone. Hey, Mel, how do you do this? How have you done this in the past? Can I see a template for this? How did you negotiate this? Like, I just learned uh, so much from 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 her and, and my time working on those movies with tiny budgets. I assume that right now you have this like bevy of potential financiers and investors that you can go to now. But as, a, okay, well, she's shaking her head. Okay, but let's imagine you do because it does, the question doesn't work unless you do. <laughs> How did you get to that point? Okay, so can you talk a little bit about developing relationships with investors starting from nowhere? And do you ta- do you tackle any sort of financier relationships in your, in your producing these days? Yeah, so this is one of the, like I think the, most challenging aspects of indie producing. And I think the most, most abstract, like 
There's no one place you can go to and be like, who are the indie financiers? It's always changing. There's so many gatekeepers for some reason. Like I always talk about this with my producer friends. So it's it's really challenging. And I've been in a position where a lot of times, like the projects that I've been a part of have come together. Like for example, searching, searching the first film came to us by way of the financier. They had made another movie on screens called Unfriended that was incredibly successful. And they actually approached Sev to see if he had any filmmakers that might be interested in like doing another project on screen. So that one like came to us with the financier attached. Everything I did with Mel and with Mark and Jay was under their like Netflix deal. So we had financing or Mark and Jay would put their own money in and then we would go to a festival and and sell it and, and make the money back. So like that step of like looking for the financing, I was very lucky in that the first like couple of movies that I got to learn on, that step was kind of like knocked out of the way. But it was on this movie that I did called All About Nina, which was something that I had basically done developed from a short into a feature with the filmmaker, where I really kind of like hit the pavement and tried to get financing. And it was on that film that I learned like how tough it is to get to financiers. Because oftentimes like people that have those relationships, they don't necessarily want to, you know, dole it out because like those people have a cap to their money. And so the, the way that I, the easiest way that I found to like getting access to people like that was either going through an agency, but then it's like, how do you get to an agency? Right. Or if you can't get to an agency, it's like using places like Sundance, the Sundance Institute, Film Independent. And like, that's the route I did. So this feature that I'd done all about Nina, the short film had gotten into the Sundance Film Festival, which was great because when we got into the festival, we knew we were already going to make the feature. We had the script for the feature. And so we really used the festival as like, cool, there's probably so many investors here. Let's network and pitch you know, at, informally everywhere we can. And that was great. And we we screened at the Eccles, which was amazing. And one of our financiers who then fell out, but who was attached for a while, literally was like in the audience that night. So it literally came from just playing at Sundance. And then we submitted the script to the Sundance Labs and it got in and it went on to go through a lot of labs. And basically through the Institute, we were able to meet with a lot of different investors. So like, I'll be candid because I feel like a lot of people aren't that like, I'm not one of those people that, and I think this comes back to like, I didn't go the assistant route other than my three month stint. So I didn't have that like five years of like, I networked and I met these people who like five years ago were assistant and now they're like working at this company that finances. So I don't have that network. And the way I kind of wiggled my way in was using, you know, using places like, or not using, but um, earning the help. And I say earn because it's like, we did so much to get into the labs and the festival, but earning the help of, you know, those institutions that, that investors go to, to seek out quality projects. When you're having like a, an investor meeting or, or investor pitch, like, what are some of the things that you say? Like, are you like outlining like a potential ROI for them? Or are you kind of like pitching them more on the experience of, of the movie? Are they all so seasoned that they already know all this and they just want to hear about the movie and whether or not they want to put the money in based off the script alone? I mean, you definitely want to hit the business benchmarks. Like they, they're going to want to know what the budget is. They're going to want to know what the comps are so they can see potential, you know, what their potential upside is going to be. But you do want to be careful because or at least in my experience, I've been careful to not like, here is the projected ROI. Like I don't put it in such black and white terms because it's, it's film. It's like the riskiest, it's the riskiest thing to put your money into. Right. So like you as a producer, like don't want to guarantee anything to anyone, like a certain high benchmark, but yeah, you definitely want to hit, this is the rough budget. These are the comps. This is the business the comps have done, but more than anything, you want to hook them on the story and, and the emotion and like, we found with all about Nina, you know, the people that responded to the project were people that got behind the story and were excited and either had some personal connection to the story and wanted to bring it to screen or were just so, so moved by the story. So I don't know, I tend to think focus less on the business, even though that may sound counterintuitive and more on like selling them emotionally, at least first, right? Because that's what's going to, that's what's going to hook them. And I think investors don't want to seem like most film, at least the film investors that I know, like they love film. They like filmmakers. Like, I don't think they want to be seen as like suits. So I'm also very careful to not pretend like I'm in a corporate boardroom, like pitching something to 
you know, too black and white. I presume you're very much in demand and that you have a lot of projects like on your slate. Like I imagine that in front of where we can't see, there's a cork board with just like hundreds of index cards. It's all digital. digital (laughs) And Alric and I are in development on a bunch of things. And I think a question I face all the time is like, how do you know which project is the one to put your time and energy into? I guess what, what, what are the deciding factors for you? Yeah. I mean, it's a great question. Definitely always have a bunch of things spinning in the air and at various stages. For me, what's become the anchor is if there's a filmmaker that I've either worked with before, or if it's like, if it's Anish and Seb, for example, that's like, that's like coming home for me. I always joke like, cause Seb, Seb and I are also producing partners, also life partners. We produce together, but also separately. And I joke that like, every time I go and do a project without him, I'm like, I can't wait to, and I, and I, like, I want a niche and I want Seb, like I want to come home. And so like, that's become my I would say anchor. It's like if Anish has a project that Seven Him have wrote, that's going to get kind of, that's going to be at the top of of my slate. And that's going to probably get 50% of my attention or as much attention as it needs. And then I kind of build around that. And part of that comes from uh, now we're, we're lucky enough that, you know, after searching and after run our movie that came out on Hulu, you know, we, I don't want to say we're in demand. That sounds so conceited. Please you are me. in demand. You are. No, no, I'll say like, it. Are you in demand? <laughs> Wait, you you are in demand, period. We have we have the ability to set projects up, I would say, a lot easier now, which is awesome. So there's that like, there's that security, I'll be honest, that there wasn't, you know, three years ago. So that's kind of like the North Star is like, what are we doing? And Seth has his company with Ryan Coogler, Proximity. And so when he started that, it was like, okay, well, I'm still going to write with a niche. And I was like, great. Yes, you are. And I'll be on the ground for those projects. So like, you can go be on the ground with proximity. I can go be on the ground with a niche. You can bounce back and forth however you need to. So that's become like, that's become like the anchor. And then really it comes down to like, I feel like the projects decide, right? Like, you, you know, Liz, like it's, if all the pieces Sometimes the pieces come together and something's ready to go. And if it's going to go, like if the cast comes along and the money's there, like you, you got to go, you know, you got to figure it out. And sometimes that means having to like step off of something else or like, you know, I've brought in partners on other things to help keep it afloat while I've stepped away to go shoot this thing. So it, I mean, really the real answer is like, it's always a shit show, you know, but whatever is like shooting or in post usually gets you know, the bulk of my attention and then somehow the rest figures itself out. So you, you just talked a little bit about making films with like your team with like a niche, you know, like that being like coming home. But when you're looking at new projects from people you haven't collaborated with before, like what are you looking for in those projects and in those, you know, creatives in order to like make you want to say yes and, you know, work on that project? Yeah, for sure. I mean, script, 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 obviously like this, that has to grab you and, and, for me, it's like, I I think about if I found out that so-and-so was making this and not me, would I be really jealous and pissed off? And, and if the answer is yes, like I chase it, you know what I mean? Like if I can't imagine someone else like on that set on the first day, getting the first shot, then I'm like, okay, then clearly like I need to do it. So script first and just that does it grab you factor and then really the the filmmakers, like are my number one thing is like, are you going to be a true collaborator? Like a lot of people, you know, say they want to collaborate or like, you know, have made films before, but then you get into it with them and you're like, Ooh, they're not necessarily really collaborative. And is this such a collaborative medium? And even if the film is, you know, I've, I've made films with filmmakers that are telling their personal story, you know what I mean? Like, and they're the only person that can tell it, but if you're not willing to have that like back and forth and want to hear others opinions in order to make your thing better then I'm kind of like not really interested because for me like as a producer I thrive off of this is back to what we were talking about earlier like I thrive off of working with people and this team like there is such a beauty in like all these people working together to make one thing and it's chaotic but somehow oftentimes it works out so you know if if you 
for me, it's like, if I'm working with someone that's just like not a team player, it's like a no, no. And if you're a team player, great. We're probably going to get along. A lot of these interviews are aspirational for us. Like Ulrich and I get to interview people who are farther along in their career than we are. And we get to pick their brain and kind of learn from it. If I could speak for Ulrich, we still have like a real sense of hunger in our careers. Like we haven't really seen a level of success that we're looking for. I look at you and I think, wow, she must really feel satisfied with where she is. So I'm curious about the emotional state of where you are. Like, I'm sh- I assume there's still hunger, but are you proud of yourself? Do you feel joy? Do you feel satisfaction? Like, what does it feel like to be where you are in your career? Man, huge hunger. Like, I don't know if I'll ever feel, I don't know if I'll ever feel satisfied because for me, it's like the thing, not that I'm not satisfied. I'm, I'm very gratified, I think, by what I do. And I think after searching came out and kind of had the success that it had getting to do run was definitely like a, a huge moment for me. Like, cause my dream ever, ever since I was little was like getting on a, a, you know, a big set. It was not really a big set, but compared to like the indie stuff, it was, it was big. We had a crane on day one. Like I was like, cool, sick. I've arrived. So that, that definitely felt like, all right, like I've made it to a certain point. One thing I, I, I would say I pride myself on is like every movie that I've done has gotten pretty much bigger in scale and scope. And that means like with the challenges. And I really don't think that I've made like no, none of no two movies that I've made feel like the same. Like, I don't think any, any of the challenges creatively have ever been the same. And I love that. So for me, like I will be really disappointed in myself if I just start, if I just continue to make like, under $10 million thrillers. And if that just becomes my like blueprint, like I don't want to be that producer. I want to be the person that's like, I'm going to do an action movie next and I'm going to make a hundred million dollar movie one day. And like, and then I'm going to go back and do this like $5 million thing. Like I just want to keep challenging myself. So I guess I, I feel, I feel very grateful that we get to make studio movies now. Cause definitely the, just the opportunity that comes with that, just having the resources, it's awesome. And it's like, it's, it's very fun. But yeah, I definitely, I definitely don't feel in any way like I've made it at all. And I think that's like, I just, I have imposter syndrome like every day, constantly. So when going from like doing like an indie movie to a studio movie, does your like method of producing or the way or any of the things that you do in your process change at all? Or is it all the same just on a bigger scale? I mean, honestly, the truth of it is it's the same. It's just more, more, more like it's suddenly it's, it's usually more cast. It's like more money. It's more, more people that you're dealing with. But if I'm going to be real, like producing this movie duck butter that I did with Mark and Jay and and Mel, which was like well under a million dollars. And we shot in like 10 days, like that in so many ways was harder than making in some ways was harder than making run, which was way bigger in budget. We had way more resources. We had a studio, but it's like the the challenges are, it's always the same thing. Like there's always not enough money. You're always trying to, you're always trying to achieve something scope wise that like, usually you're not going to have the resources for. So you're always trying to like figure it out. I think the thing that changes is I found on, on run and searching too, is like so much of my time. And I've had to figure out like how to give myself enough time to be there to work with the director and, and to give them what they need becomes like liaising with the studio. So I would say like, that's the biggest difference. It's like every decision that we make here with the team, I have to then go and like run it past them or pitch them, get approval, make them aware. Sometimes we have to sit and have a whole conversation about it. Sometimes there's going to be back and forth, a disagreement. Like that's the, that's been the biggest kind of shift. And so it feels like there's less time than ever in the days, but it's the same skill set. It really is. And I think if you can do, if you can make a $500,000 movie, $10 million movie, it's not necessarily harder. It's like different, but it's not necessarily harder, if that makes sense. Can I ask you a quick follow-up question? I'm sorry, Liz. So give us a couple examples of the kind of things that you need to clear by the studio. Like, is this like changing a line in the script on the day? Like, is this like changing a location? Like, like I would literally hear like some of the different things that like how, how, you know, fine, like tuned or into the nitty gritty do the studios get on these, these films? Yeah. I mean, it all, it all depends too on, on the relationship, like, or if there's an executive that's like on the ground with you. So if, if they are, they're seeing things, they're in meetings, so you're not having to like go out of your way and run things through them. But I'll give you guys a, maybe a specific example will help. Like 
on Run, if you, if you guys are familiar with that movie, there's a sequence where the daughter who uses a wheelchair to get around in her daily life basically gets locked in her bedroom because of her nefarious mom and realizes that the only way out is to go out her window and across a roof. So that was like a huge, huge challenge for us because again, back to the theme of like, there's never enough money. We we would we wanted to do that as practical as possible because it's just going to look better than doing it up against a green screen. But we had an actress who used a wheelchair in real life, who had a real life disability. So wasn't necessarily an obvious option to just throw her on a roof, right? And so this became like a weeks long process of figuring out you know, Anish, our director storyboarded, like these are, this is what I want to achieve. And then it was seven eyes job to figure out, you know, with all the department heads, okay, how do we do this on budget safely? And most importantly, getting, getting the shots that Anish needs to, to stitch it together. And so in all that comes together, you know, there's concerns for your actress, there's budgetary concerns, location concerns, safety concerns, all of that. And so every step of the way, we would like, let's say we'd figure out, all right, here's a version where we're going to do like 60% on location with a stunt double. We're going to do face replacement. And then we're going to build this much on the stage. Well, the studio wants to know, all right, how much does that cost versus what is the cheaper version? What is the safer version? So like, even though you're presenting the version that you think is best, they're going to constantly be like, well, how do I do, how do you do it cheaper? How do you do it safer? And so they're involved in all that. So you're basically like putting together, I would say for some of these sequences, it almost feels like you're putting together like pitches and then you go to the studio and you're like, this is how we're going to achieve it. And you have to be ready to show them usually different versions because they're going to ask for it. And so with the run, with the roof sequence, that's what we did. We came up with different versions and then we were pitching it to a woman named Kelly Connup, who's total badass, who was like the head of production for, for Lionsgate and, and was assigned to our movie. And we kind of, you know, we sat through with her and, and there was back and forth, obviously, because they're they're going to always, they're going to prefer the version that's a little bit cheaper and definitely like safer to avoid, you know, nobody wants. And obviously neither do we, not to say we don't prioritize safety, but like usually the filmmakers don't want the cheaper version of anything. But that that's that's a good example of like, you have, you have an idea of how you're going to execute. Now you got to like get it approved. But yeah, I would say they do, they do get to see like everything. They sign off on locations, wardrobe, all that. I think what differs and it depends on like the studio and the relationship that you have is like how much input they give. Like I think on both movies, we had a lot of trust from the studios. And I think we earned by being very clear up front with like, these are our intentions. This is what the world is going to look like. This is how it's going to feel. It's going to be grounded for searching. You know what I mean? Like everything is going to feel real life. Then there wasn't nitpicking from them. It was it was more like, we just want to see what things look like. Cool. Or like once in a while, it's like, oh, wait, we shot where we shot a movie there. This actually happened on searching. They're like, oh, we just shot a movie there. That's like a similar thriller, not huge temple movie. Like maybe you guys shouldn't use that location. And it's like, cool. Thanks for that. So it's that kind of back and forth. I'm engaging in conversations right now about value of actors. And I'm curious if the narrative I'm receiving is the same narrative you're receiving, where there's certain actors that are put in front and kind of tiered out. And are you, how do you derive the most accurate information about the cast that you're looking for? Is it the sales agents? Is it the casting director? Is it just whoever your director wants to work with? Like, how are you deciding cast? Yeah, I mean, definitely, I think it depends on how the movie is set up. So where the where the money's coming from, obviously, because even on indies, sometimes like things are cast contingent. Like I've had I've had deals done where it's if, if these two people that you guys said are attached aren't in it or or a backup that's similar tier, then the money won't go forth. So if it a lot of times it comes, it's like determined by the money and they're going to be the final kind of gatekeeper. But within that, yeah, definitely it's usually who's best creatively, but within the parameter of like, do we need a a lister to get a green light? Like, unfortunately, that is a thing. I will say, I do think that you can, depending on the budget tier, like for us, you know, under the 10 million mark, right? Like there hasn't been like, you got to go get Brad Pitt which is great because there's a lot of people that are not Brad Pitt that are not in that like top, whatever, like the 10 actors 
nowadays that can just get a movie greenlit. Yeah. I don't know if I'm answering the question. Oh, that's helpful. I just wanted to know if, if you're hearing the same things I am, which it sounds like. Very much so. Yeah. Cast, 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 like even, even, even on a million dollar indie, like it, it does matter. And there is like this weird tier, like it's an invisible, like no one is actually branded as right. like your A-list and it's so confusing. There should be a database. We should, should create be. a database. I, I agree. That. It would be very helpful for producers, but yeah, it all comes from like, I feel like everyone just weighs in and then suddenly people are like, yeah, I guess that's the tier one person. Like the, the cast, usually the, with the help of the casting director and somebody from the studio, we're like trying to figure it out together. Here's a question. I I, just, I, will, I can't wait to hear your answer. Does IMDb star meter ever come into the conversation when you're casting movies? Or is that just like a totally useless thing that no one pays attention to? Okay. It doesn't come into the conversation in a way where like I've ever had someone directly reference it, but I will say like, if you're looking at someone that you thought was like in the thousands and they happen to be like in the hundreds when you're like putting together your list, that's like a little lean forward moment. You're like, what did they, <laughs> like, why did they, but yeah, I've never like, I've never seen it on anyone's like grid, like quote, mm. like the thing. All right. I but think- do you think, Okay, I was just yeah. Okay, well, never mind. We can be, we can. We got five it. minutes left, Natalie. We're gonna do a speed <laughs> round of the final six questions. Yeah, that works for you. So, what's the first film you ever made, and how do you feel about it now? First film I ever made was called Angel in Disguise. It was when I was fourteen. It was the first complete film I ever made. My little sister played a disaster child that a babysitter played by me has to watch. It was a silent film. <laughs> And looking back, I'm so happy I made it because I like captured my little sister when she was like three on camera. She's super cute. And I learned so much about coverage on that (laughs) trip. So I'm very grateful that I made it. And for a 14 year old, I think it holds up. I'm going to say I'm confident about that one. (laughs) What's the best filmmaking advice you've ever received? Ooh, best filmmaking advice I've ever received is probably... From my high school teacher who said, I don't know blank great. I only know great. And fill in the blank is don't ever like justify what you're making. Like if you're like, I only have $10. So it's it's Mm -hmm. great enough for a $10 budget. He taught us like throw that out. Like don't, don't set your limits on your limitations creatively. I love that. What's the worst filmmaking advice you've ever received or heard or witnessed? I think that a lot of times people will say, just just write, like don't don't think about the limitation. <laughs> right. And I think sure, if you're like whatever, if you're like Steven Spielberg or like, you know what I mean? Like if you if you have these unlimited resources. But but I think for specifically for like people who are trying to break out or like indie filmmakers, I think that's unfair advice because you're like setting someone up to have a really challenging road Mm -hmm. and to potentially waste their time writing something that they're never going to be able to make. Do you have a goal as a filmmaker? Yes, definitely. I want to be on like a $200 million movie one day, like a huge fun adventure movie. Like one of the biggest influences on me was Pirates of the Caribbean. I saw that movie like four times in theaters when I was young and the behind the scenes, like DVD, I'm pretty sure broke because I watched it so many times. (laughs) I can't believe I'm admitting that out loud. It's very nerdy. That has been, that's been a goal for me. Like I want, I don't know if I'm going to like it, but I'm like, I got to try it because man, like what, what a like privilege to be able to like work on something so big that so many people like just the idea of working on a tent pole is really exciting to me because it's just like how cool it's like an indie indie filmmakers dream to have everyone see your thing like it's unheard of it's so cool if you could go back in time what's the piece of advice you'd give yourself probably don't have a hang up about getting my start as like a nuts and bolts I, I started basically by essentially line producing. I never took that credit. And I used to think like, oh, creative producers, like so much cooler. And like, they're going to look down on the, and it's like, wear that with like a badge, a badge of honor. Because now on the flip side where I don't, where I'm not the person doing that anymore, I, first of all, bless the good line producers in the world. Like they're amazing. And also there's so many people that don't, whether it's producers or like studio execs, 
like not going to name anyone, but like who don't understand or appreciate that side of it, which is like, there's no movie if you don't know how to do that side of it. So I think like just owning that a bit more. Nice. Last question. Is making movies hard? So hard, but so (laughs) fun. So fun too. So fun. The funnest. You did it. Do you want to call out Searching too? Do you what? What, what do you want to encourage people to do to support you in any way? Thank you guys for having me and be on the lookout sometime in December. We think for the first trailer for Searching Two, which is now called Missing. Ooh, <laughs> very cool. <laughs> Are you a creative who just wrapped up your independent film, new book, or album release? Or are you just looking for help on your fundraising campaign? Well, then you're going to need a marketing strategy. Smart House is a marketing agency that specializes in creative projects and independent films. They provide digital strategies, social media support, publicity services, branding, and fundraising strategies to help indie artists just like you. Smart House was founded to help indie artists with all budgets find their audience and bring their projects to the world. Smart House has helped a ton of artists reach their goals, including the Making Movies is Hard podcast. That's right. They're helping us grow our audience and they can help you too. Go to smarthousecreative.com to get started today. Liz, what do you remember about our talk with Natalie? Gosh, she was so lovely. It was a while back because I got so excited that we got to talk to her that I was like, let's book it. (laughs) And I got a little weird about it. I do remember her being... So she's business partner and life partner to Sev Ohanian, who was our guest 350... 300, baby. Oh, 300. 300. 300. So yeah. they're like power couple extraordinaire. Mm-hmm. And I just remember her being very humble, very kind and warm, just like very warm. Do you remember that? Yeah. Huh. And honest and like yeah. super open about everything, about her her journey as a producer, like why she likes producing. Yeah, it was a really fascinating conversation. Um, and I'm going to be honest. And Natalie probably listened to this. But I was a little concerned. I was like, oh, is it going to be too much of the same conversation that we had with Sev? Because like, they worked mm. together on a lot of stuff. But uh, wrong. Talked about completely different things. It was really, really great episode. And like, I'm really, really excited that we ended up having her for 400 because I think it was a really enlightening conversation for people who want to like, you know, learn more about like what producers do, the life of a producer, their importance and how they collaborate with directors. So I feel like even if you're not interested in becoming a producer, this is like a super valuable lesson to like kind of lesson episode to hear more about what what a producer actually does. Well, and her and Sev, like I'm going to I'm going to call it right now, like they're going to lead this industry in like yeah. five to 10 years. Like they're already doing an incredibly impressive work, but I, you can just see it happen. It's going to happen for sure. Yeah. I mean, Seb's already like, you know, executive producing Space Jam. And I think he might have been a producer on Black Panther 2, potentially too, I think. And so, yeah, he's just all over the place. Fancy, 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 really cool guy. So yeah, it was really, really a fun conversation with Natalie. Excited to see Searching too. It sounds amazing. It sounds like a really cool movie. Yeah. But now it's time for the game. Okay. I don't think I peaked. I think that went through. Oh, you did it. Nice. Are you ready, Auric? I'm ready. Let's do it. Okay. And what's interesting about this is like Eric sent me this question. By the way, the game is we present each other with indie film quandary quagmires problems. We we set forth the hypothetical problem that Auric has never read. He's listening to it for the first time now and he decides how he would handle it as the indie filmmaker that he is. What's interesting about this is Eric presents the question and then right below, he does an indent a bunch of times. Right below, he says, do not read until after both of you have given in your answers and like uh, there's more information that he's going to share with us that i will say after you give your answer but i wanted to give wow, Eric a hard okay. time because there's no indentations before <laughs> <laughs> it's like question and then immediately do not read okay here's the question you're gearing up for a high profile biopic the historical figure of the biopic went through a tumultuous childhood and then converted to a religion before leading a cultural revolution during pre-production you were informed that in order to film in the same holy sites that your biopic is set you and members of cast and crew will have to convert to that religion do you a (laughs) convert to the new religion and film in the holy location b try to recreate the holy locations on a set C, rewrite the script and write out these locations. D, 
other. All right. So I'm already hired to make this movie. I've already agreed to do it. Or it's like I'm considering whether or not I want to make this movie. You're in pre-production. So I would assume oh. you're on your end. So converting to the religion to shoot these scenes or recreating it elsewhere. Huh. And like these are like the, the most important locations in the movie. It sounds like they like super... It's just in order to film in the same holy sites that your biopic is set. And it is about a historical figure who went through a tumultuous childhood and then converted to a religion before leading a cultural revolution. And like I can convert to this religion and then unconvert from to this religion. I mean, I would assume that's how most conversions could occur in life. I've never I've never done that before. So I've never like (laughs) changed my religion or whatever i'm not also a very religious person i have my own idea of religion you know and like spirituality and everything yeah but like i'm i'm not like it's not like i don't believe in like like organized mass like religion things like people going to church or whatever like that's fine if that's like what you need in your life like totally respect that but like i'm also like yeah i'm not like way into that so i think yeah i'd be fine fuck i'll change I'll, I don't dig it. I'll change out again. You know, as long as they don't make, make me like cut off my hand or like, you know, become vegetarian or whatever. Like as long as some, some that would be crazy, a best decision of your life. All right. Yeah. Best it would be decision. good for me to be vegetarian. You know, I could probably use a year of vegetarianism. It'd probably be good for me. But yeah, I mean, as long as they're not like trying to like, you know, like I don't have to, you know, whatever, like have my firstborn be like, you know, sent to the holy Mecca five times a year to like, you know, be bat- basted in buttercream or whatever kind of crazy religion thing you could do. It's like, no, like fine. Like it's all good. Like I'll, I'll convert. And then if I don't dig it, I'll, I'll unconvert. Maybe I'll discover something new about myself. Maybe I'll love this new religion. Who knows? So yeah, that's kind of an easy answer for me, but I know you, you're a little bit more, I don't know. What do you, what would you do? I would not convert. I would recreate the holy locations on a set. I am agnostic. I'm an agnostic Jew. So I also, I don't believe in organized religion, but I just know when my son, my husband is a really devout Catholic. He goes to church every single week and oh, wow. it wasn't even a question like I didn't ever I no one said you have to get your son baptized but I knew it was important so I offered up I said I'd be okay if we get him baptized but I re- but we weren't married when sorry this this story does have a point I promise wow. we weren't married <laughs> after like our son was born and we still weren't married we didn't get married till um a, like a year or two ago and I had to go through a process where I had to like promise to raise our child in a specific way. And I had to renounce Satan and I had to do all these things. And it made me incredibly uncomfortable because I don't believe in Satan as a cultural Jew. This is not hell. It's not something we're familiar. This is a lot of things that I felt like I didn't want to be disrespectful to my husband's faith, but I didn't, I didn't want to compromise my principles and my values. And I feel like converting to a new religion for a film would be compromising these like self-righteous stubborn values that I have about it in my agnostic Hmm. belief system. Cause Hmm. I do think, I think being agnostic often gets thought of as like, Oh, whatever you don't believe in anything. You should be disregarded, but actually it's very important to me that I identify as agnostic. So well, agnostic is different than atheist, right? Like yes. you, cause like agnostic, you like, you don't believe in anything, but you're not saying it doesn't exist. You're yeah. You're questioning. You're on a search. You're not saying definitively whether there is a God or not, but atheism believes there is no God. And for me, that compromise to say that I believe in another God, like I was a Jew who went to Catholic school. Like my upbringing was like, you're different and <laughs> figure out a comfort level with that difference. And so it's too ingrained in me to convert to a new religion and to like make that huh. sacrifice, even if it's a very superficial one. I'm not willing. I'm not willing to do it. Like at this, I found that this is a very weird, touchy area for me. So I'm. Huh. I won't compromise, but I would recreate the holy locations on a set if it felt like it was still respectful to the culture and I got the culture's buy-in on the recreation. I guess what I'm trying to say is like, I think it would be disrespectful to a religion to moonlight in that mm. religion. So I'm not willing to do that. And it's disrespectful to my agnostic status to pretend to be mm. something else for a little bit. I, that sounds so judgy, Auric. I don't mean to be judgy towards you. I wish I could just be like, fuck it. 
let's make a movie. I guess if it was like, if I had to lie, right? Like if I had to be like, yes, I really believe in, you know. I think you do. That's the, the conversion the butter, is a process. The, the, the buttercream basting. Like that's really important to me. <laughs> like, you know, I think that would be harder, you know. But if I was being welcomed into this religion, like, yes, my child. You know, whatever. Like the buttercream is in you. We know that you will be good. Is this really just making fun of our religions? Am I being terrible? Right I know. Now? I, if there were a religion that used buttercream basting, then yes. <laughs> but since I don't believe there is one, I think you're safe. Okay. Good. Well, the, the, for all the buttercream basters out there, I'm sorry if I have finished. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I don't know. Like, I, I think it, 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 maybe it would depend on what it was. Like, if it was a satanic cult religion, I don't think I would want to be a part of that. If it was, if it was like negativity around it, you know? Sure. But like, if it was just a, you know, run of a mill, like, you know, whatever, we love, you know, God or something, like, you know, <clears throat> whatever. I, I don't know. I probably I think there's I'd some least, exceptions. Like if there was, at least if it was hear like, about it. If it was like Baha'i or if it was like Unitarian Universalism or if it was even like Quakerism, I'd be like, oh, OK, I'm on board for some of these things. They're kind of like peace, loving hippie yeah. religions. But if it were like Catholicism, I'm like, no, I'm sorry. Like, I can't. That's that feels real inappropriate for me. <laughs> to, act, to, to yeah. act in that capacity. Yeah, I think anything that's an exclusionary religion, I think I, that would probably actually. Now I'm doubling back on my my, my thing. Like, <laughs> Come to I my don't, side. I don't like I don't like any religion that's like exclusionary of any type of person or people or mm. belief. You know, which I guess to some degree, like most religions are exclusionary of at least some kinds of beliefs. You I mean, know? it's a club. You have to join the club. You have to yeah. do something to get into the club. Eric, I need to know more about the club before I can say I won't or will not join. I All think right. that's really the, the true answer. It's like a, I, I would be open depending on what the situation was, you know. But yeah, I mean, I feel like recreating it. It's always a good option. As long as like that culture is like, sure, that's fine. <laughs> Because I also yeah. think you have to get buy-in from the community. Okay, do you want to hear what Eric von Esser said? Yes, yes, please. This question is based on the real-life production of Malcolm X, 1992, where director wow. Spike Lee and members of his cast and crew had to convert to the Nation of Islam in order to gain access to the city of Mecca. Oh, interesting. Wow. And he did it, huh? Well, I guess so. He did. Eric didn't write that down, but I would assume so. Well, he must have, you know. Because they made they, the movie. They, they made the movie. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, I don't know. Would I do it for what I? Yeah, I don't know. No, I mean, but if Spike Lee is like, yeah, Islam is cool. I'm into it. That's yeah. a completely different story. Yeah, that's true. I'd have to learn more. <laughs> Tell me more about this religion. But anyways, yeah. Good stuff. Interesting question. I mean, I don't know. I want to know from anyone that I did. did uh, our answers at all offensive is this question. What do you people think of this question? What would you what would you do in this situation? I really want to know, like, am I am I crazy for saying the things I'm saying or is this acceptable? I don't know. I'm just thinking I was watching a movie that was shot on location and it looks so good when it's shot on location versus shot, shot on sets. And I'm just like, man. Locations always are better, you know, yeah. like they, and yeah. especially if it's like I'm, I'm just imagining like this most beautiful like vista and views that like people don't get to see because like it's very reserved for like certain people. Like I'd love to share that with the world, you know, I think that would be really cool for like that to be added to like the cinematic history of filmmaking. So that's what that's where my answer is hmm. coming from. You know, it's like just like um, this amazing thing that like I'd want other people to get to see, not necessarily about like, you know, like my own personal, like whatever, because I feel like I'm, I'm a very open person and yeah. I like learning about things. And if it was a chance to learn more about this different, these different people and like they are open to it and it wasn't like this negative thing where I had to like, you know, be bullshitting them, I think it'd be cool. You know? I'm pretty sure you'd have to, because even just to do this baptism for my son and they knew I was an unmarried Jew, like we had to, I had to like fill out a survey and sign my name. And there was like this whole thing about like making promises. And that was just for a baptism. Oh, wow. Wow. I mean, I, I got kicked out of Hebrew school when I was young because I told them I didn't believe in organized religion. So like, oh, wow. this has been a tumbling down. <laughs> And I believe in it for others. I just don't believe in it for myself. So I feel like yeah. this would not work out well for me. I don't think it would work out well for me either. I think I would try <laughs> and they'd be like, you idiot, you're a heretic. Get out of here. <laughs> you're not allowed to be here. You're crazy. What's you're crazy. wrong with you? You crazy person. You. 
All right, Liz, I'm very excited to talk about this. I know yeah. we've already been talking for a while, but, you know, yeah. we've been doing this, you know, I've been doing the show for 400 episodes. You've been doing it for over 200, I think. Wow. Like, I think you started around like two, 210. So, yeah, almost 200, mm-hmm. you know, but then you had done a couple of other episodes before that. So, like, you're, you know, you're really close <laughs> to, 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 to 200. But I want to know, like, what have you learned in this? Time? Like, what are your, some of your takeaways? Like, how have you grown as a filmmaker through doing the podcast or have you, or are there no takeaways? Like, like, let me know what you got. Yeah. Well, I, I think there's been like some takeaways about myself and then there's some takeaways about the industry and the ones about myself are like, you know, I do get a little nervous before each interview, but I always get really excited when I ask exactly what's in my head and it comes out exactly the way I want. And I think, I know this is not what you asked, but the takeaway is like, no one is above these ridiculous hippy dippy questions that sometimes we traffic in. Mm. And sometimes they create the most interesting conversation where people are taken off, uh, taken off their guards and answering in really genuine ways. So like I've learned that we can make meaningful connections with this podcast. If you ask questions that are outside of the norm of like, what's it like working with Lindsay Lohan? And you know, <laughs> I don't know. That's, that's, that's the one that came to mind. What have I learned about the industry that almost every single person that I look up to or envy or am jealous over or think that they have it figured out, no one has it figured out and no one is satisfied with their career. Like, I think we never ask, like, are you happy in your daily life? Are you happy in your personal life? But we ask about satisfaction and goals. And do you feel like you've made it? And I feel like almost every single person genuinely has said, like, no, I do not feel like I've made it. And they're all people that you and I look up to and think that they have like dream careers. So it's made me feel doing the podcast has made me feel more brave and like less alone, right? Less lonely in my quest for success in this industry. What if, what about you? Yeah. I mean, when I started, like I basically like, like, you know, when like you go into an interview, especially when you're younger, and, like you feel like you have all this experience and you're like, so like overqualified or rip, like this job is for you. And then you get the job and then you're like, I don't know. Shit. <laughs> like, I'm just like, I barely, like, I don't even know how I got this job. Like, cause my experience is nowhere. Like I'm not as all encompassing as I thought I was. There's so much more for me to learn and grow and whatever. I kind of feel like that way with filmmaking. Like when I started this, like I, you know, I felt pretty confident. Like I had known like, oh yeah, like I made a short film. Like I spent all this money on it. Like, you know, we went to film festivals. Like I made, I shot my second short film. Like mm. I felt like, yeah, I know what I'm doing here. And then like when you, when you, you know, basically after a couple of years, I'm like, yeah, I don't know anything about what I'm doing. Like I can't even like raise money for a movie like at all. Like I thought like when I started the podcast, I think I thought after two years, like the movie would have been shot and released, you know, by that time. And it wasn't not even close to being shot, you know, it was we like, I think I just got to AFM, you know, or I hadn't even gone to AFM yet. Like I was planning to go to AFM at the two year mark of making this podcast. So it's just like, now it's like a hundred episodes or so, you know? Yeah. And so I feel like through this whole thing, like I've, I've grown as a filmmaker. Like I, fi- I feel like I have a lot more confidence like I actually like feel like I know how it all comes together now in a way, you know, where I didn't before, where I thought I had ideas. I was like, was very the whole making of your first feature was very like like mystical to me. Like it was like kind of this amazing thing. And like you know, talking to you on the show, like way before you became a co-host, you were like very matter of fact. I'm like, no, you just set dates. Like anyone can do it. Like it's just a thing. Just do it. Just make it happen. And you know, I think at the end of of 400 episodes, I'm like, yeah, it is just making it happen. <laughs> Like you just do it. It's it's no different than making a short film. It's just a lot, lot harder and a lot, lot longer of a process, you know. But it's it's just like the same. It's like that kind of thing where you know you you feel like you have to like unlock some special connection or some special knowledge or some special something in order to like make a movie and whatever. But it's the, it's realizing there is nothing like that. There's no special knowledge. There's no special connection. There's no person or type of person who's gonna like fund your movie and like clap their hands and it makes it happen for you. It's like, no, like you have to just do it yourself and just grind it out, you know? And after you make your first one, you just got to grind out the next one and then grind out the next one and just keep grinding them out, you know? And I feel like that's the real lesson I've learned is that like, it's just making movies a lot of hard work and no matter how much success you have, it's always going to be a lot of hard work. And even when you have 
the magical thing that happens where you like you you go to Sundance or you win an award or you get an agent or manager and you get hired to direct a movie. It's still hard work. Still it's, hard work. And that only happens to like one percent of people. But those people still have to work maybe even harder than than we do, you know. And so it's like it's all very hard, and you really have to be in love with the journey, you know. I think because like if you don't love the journey, then you know, what's the point? Because 99% of it is the journey. You know? So I think that's, those are my biggest takeaways. But yeah, I was, I was talking to Amy Taylor, who's co-writing Best Friends Forever with me this morning, and she's trying to get another project of hers off the ground. And we came to this realization, and maybe this is an obvious statement, but it's there is no well-worn path. We know this. There's no path to making a film. But sometimes she and I just kind of spin our wheels in order to create momentum and sometimes the chaos of like, oh, I'll work on the deck or I'll announce it on Twitter or I'll go to this networking event, like the chaos of these random events that we try to do in order to build a foundation to make the film. Sometimes they create the magic, if that makes sense. So it's like, because there's no path, it feels like it could be the next step could be around the corner. And so there's like a lot of wasted energy that in the moment of me spinning my wheels and throwing spaghetti against the wall or whatever it is, like telling people about the movie, doing nothing like concretely to make this movie, even though it feels like it's not actually helping. I think it does. Like, I think these conversations like they inspire you and me. And maybe it's not like we're making our movie is a direct result of talking to Molly Elfman or or she Nagapal or whoever it is. But there is like a little something that gets turned on through that. Co- yeah. So I was just saying like in there's nothing. I agree. There's nothing mystical. I've said the same thing myself. But at the same at the same time, progress can be made in the most unlikely squishiest of circumstances of just being inspired by another filmmaker talking about their process. So I think that's another benefit of the show is like, I've had people say to me that they listen to the show and they love this one and they love that one. They love that one. And I think they love it because the relatableness of some of the interviews and even that alone can motivate someone to be like, yeah, I can do that. And yeah, I can do that too. Yeah. Just, just like, learn, like realizing that these people are just people that everyone's just a person, yeah. you know, that Tom Hanks, Tom Cruise, like these people, they're just people. No, well, they're who- not people, but I have <laughs> other, but like Riley Stearns and, you know, like Natalie Kasabian. But I think they are just people. They're just people <laughs> who have had lots of success and they're, yeah. but they, they have the same problems emotions feelings that we do like any person that you work with is just a person you know and like i feel like the more that you treat people like people and less like gods or whatever you know i think the better it's gonna go for everybody because like we just realize that we're all just we're we have the same like like our our own human emotions and feelings and problems are very universal even though we we don't realize it like everyone's dealing with like you know stubbing their toe or yeah. you know like really having to go to the bathroom very bad but holding it for a really long time for some reason like these, the these are things i don't know right like i just think like this kind of that was another realization just kind of really realizing that people are just people and mm. you know no matter what they do or what they've made you know like they're they're just we're all in it in the same way you know like all as filmmakers we're all just like throwing things up a wall to see what sticks and you know, maybe you throw it up one time and it's Raging Bull. You throw it up another time and it's Shutter Island, right? Like, you never know. Like, <laughs> really? Like it's just like, you, I don't know. <laughs> I'm just saying. <laughs> they can't all be Raging Bull, you know? Oh, like, they're, they're going to yeah. be, you know, some are going to be better than others. And there's probably lots of people out there who love Shutter Island. <sighs> I saw it at like 1 a.m. in Los Angeles opening night. No, it's fine. It's a fine movie. I think it would be nice. <laughs> I mean, well, though. I, you know, for however much you enjoy Shutter Island, you got to admit it's not Raging Bull. No, it's not Raging Bull. And also, I don't I didn't really enjoy Shutter Island, but <laughs> but he's so genius and untouchable. But I think it'd be nice because I know we have an interview later today. But maybe we refurbish some of the questions we ask on a regular basis. And maybe sure. it's like. Are you happy? Are you satisfied with your career? Things like that. Like, I know we always ask, like, how hard was this compared to all the other projects? But it's like, does that really motivate a really interesting answer every time? You know, 
can we dig deeper? Yeah, I don't think we should ask that. Are you happy with your career before the interview? <laughs> no, towards the end, towards the end. <laughs> that should be what I because I think that like a question that's going to be like, I think a lot of people are going to, you know, could stumble with, you know, yeah. in general. And like, I don't think you want to ask that until you've like you, you've gotten the cl- the most warmth out of them as possible. Like you, we are yeah. the most connected to them as we're going to be in this interview. Like, I think that's when you ask that question. Yeah. But yeah, I don't know. I'm open to switching out the opening question. Or how, how, how hard is well, this project? We'll see what happens today. To yeah. We'll see what happens. I'm open. I'm an open book, Liz. But I think we should, uh, we should like, you know, w- one more thing before you take us out. I just want to thank everybody for listening for 400 episodes. I really enjoy this whole thing. I will not stop unless I lose my voice. And even then, maybe I will try to figure out some sort of electronic voice that I could create to do it. So yeah, but I'm really glad that Liz, you're here with me and that we yeah. have the team that we have. Eric and Jeff are amazing. Yeah, it's kind of crazy that like, you know, like I lost a partner and then I gained three more through this, which like I think at some like at episode 183 or 84, I was like, how is this even gonna happen? This is I'm lost without Timothy. But like now, look, we've got this great team. So I'm very, very thankful that it's worked out this way and I'm really excited for the future. Oh. And with that, you could send us a question, comment, or suggestion to podcast at makingmoviesishard.com. If you like the show, you can leave us a review on iTunes. Check us out on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter at MMIH Podcast, YouTube at Making Movies is Hard Podcast. Check out the International Screenwriters Association, which is an organization designed to connect writers with filmmakers through the programs they offer. Head on over to networkisa.org to sign up for free today. Thanks to Natalie Kasabian for coming on the show. We really hope we're not screwing up your name. Name, but uh, maybe maybe you could come on the show and yell at us, at us about it if we are and that would be great because then we could have a part two thanks to our editor Jeff Reimut for doing the editing and thanks to our producer Eric for being awesome thanks to all of you for listening 400 episodes that's insane this is wonderful talk to all of you next week it's like every time I put my phone down it's like bing 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 like ah uh. God damn it. Please. I need a vacation. I just had a vacation. I need another vacation. You need a vacation from your vacation. Yeah, but vacation was great, though. I love the vacation.